Okay, thanks, Maya. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here bright and early. Um, insert hangover effect joke here. Um, <laughs> so this morning's session is all about um, marine macrophytes. And so in this session, we're gonna be hearing about uh, seagrass restoration, uh, macroalgae, seagrass mapping, um, topics that we've covered in other sessions so far, but this session is all about um, those awesome green plants that live underwater. So. With that, um, I'll let you know we're going to hold all questions until the end. So the speakers are going to come up here, give their presentation, sit behind me on the podium, and then uh, we will do questions for everybody at the end. So our first presentation today is from Luis Lizcano Sandoval. He is a PhD candidate at the USF College of Marine Science. And his presentation is seagrass cover in Tampa Bay over the last 30 years observed by satellites. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the seagrass cover changes in Tampa Bay by using satellite imagery. Yes. So, in 2020, there were reported about 56 square kilometers of seagrass beds in Tampa Bay, uh, according to the uh, Southwest Florida Water Management District data. Uh, the seagrasses in Tampa Bay are usually monitored by Tampa Bay Story Program every, every year with in situ transits. Uh, there is also an aerial mapping program by the Southwest Florida Water Management District. This happens every two years. Uh, we also have some water quality monitoring program by the Environmental Protection Commission of Hillsborough County. Next. So I think that uh, most of our, our uh, familiar with this kind of data. So here we have the green bars are seagrass coverage. The orange line is chlorophyll A concentration in Tampa Bay. So basically here we can see that between 1950 and 1982, there was a 47% decline in seagrass coverage. Um, after that, between 1982 and 2016, the seagrass uh, just recovery, uh, recovered area. So there was an increase about uh, 192 percent. We can also know that after 1980s the chlorophyll A concentration just decreased. Um, this is because of all of the improvements in water quality in Tampa Bay. Uh, this was a uh, chlorophyll A concentration is considered as a water quality parameter, uh, as a proxy of water quality. Uh, we can see that it was very effective for, for helping seagrass uh, the, the recovery of the seagrasses in Tampa. So by 20 by 2014, the seagrass coverage uh, just reached a, a similar um, area to that in 1950. Uh, but also between 2016 and 2020, there was an 80% decrease in seagrass coverage. So of course, this uh, this is very important to know like how how is the seagrass are changing at these uh, scales. But we also want to know how it's changing like in shorter in shorter time scales uh, for management purposes. Uh, next. Uh, there is a way to uh, to do that or complement all of this uh, information uh, by using satellite imagery. So satellite imagery uh, provides uh, the, the spectral uh, data for all of the objects. So with this, we can uh, use this uh, for identifying seagrasses, uh, but there are some issues with this because not all of the satellite data out there is public uh, available. And also sometimes we need like a, a, a very high computing uh, performance for processing all of the satellite uh, data. But now we have uh, platforms like Google Earth Engine. Uh, Google Earth Engine uh, provides a lot of uh, satellite data they update this every day. Uh, also, the people can use the platform for processing all of this satellite data. So we have, for example, some satellite missions like Landsat and Sentinel. We can see that this uh, satellite covers uh, more than 30 years of data. So this is something that we can use for, for seagrass mapping. So the Landsat satellites provide imagery at 30 meter resolution per pixel. Uh, delivers about 23 images every year. Uh, Sentinel-2 Sentinel satellites uh, provide images at a better resolution and about three times more images uh, every year. Um, next. 
So this is an option for uh, quantifying and, and estimating the spatial and temporal uh, changes in sea rest cover in Tampa Bay by using this public uh, satellite imagery in the cloud. Uh, we also wanted to compare seagrass cover trends estimated by satellite and aerial well, mapping. So here I want to mention that we only use the estimates of continuous seagrass uh, data, uh, the seagrass class from the Southwest uh, Florida Water Management District data. Uh, we didn't use the SPARES uh, seagrass uh, estimations because the satellite data at these resolutions is not very sensitive with, with the SPARES seagrass. So we only just focus on the, on the dense seagrass beds. Uh, finally, we wanted to explore water quality data to find any patterns related to seagrass cover changes in Tampa Bay. Yes. So this is the workflow we use for processing the satellite images and doing serious mapping. Uh, we integrated uh, open source tools like uh, Python, QGIS with Google Earth Engine. Uh, we first uh, needed to identify all of the best images for doing serious mapping. So not, not all of the images are good for this. So we need to see the seagrasses there. So we use some algorithm, algorithms. Uh, we use the normalized difference turbidity index for this. So this index uh, ranges from zero to minus one. So basically all of those uh, values, all, all of those pixel values with uh, closer to zero, usually shows uh, turbidity, songling, and in some cases uh, clouds. So in, in uh, the other values, uh, the, the values closer to minus one, are usually uh, associated to clear waters, as we can see here. So we use all of those images presenting the values closer to minus one for doing seagrass mapping. After that, uh, we use uh, we process all of the satellite imagery by doing atmospheric corrections, work column corrections. We also collected uh, ground truth uh, data from previous seagrass distribution maps and also from descriptions uh, in the literature. We use this data for training and validation of the, of the classifiers. We use the support vector machine classifier. And finally, we uh, created annual mosaics of the, of the classified uh, seagrass beds. So we process and classify 74 images between 1990 and early 2021. We can see this is the annual distribution of the 74 images. So we were able to, uh, to find uh, good images for seagrass mapping in only 16 years within this period. Uh, we can know that after 2016, the number of images uh, were higher. This is because we use Sentinel-2 data. Uh, with this data, we were able to do also uh, seagrass annual mapping. Uh, for 19, 1990 and 2015, uh, there were some gaps. Uh, we only used Landsat satellite uh, data. This is the only distribution of the 74 images. We can see that most of the images were from uh, the early and late uh, months of every year. So we didn't we didn't have like many images in the middle of the years because in this uh, in these months there were a lot of uh, clouds uh, and sunlight in water surface. Next. So this is the comparison of the seagrass cover trends between aerial and satellite mapping. Uh, we can see that that was uh, highly correlated. We can see that the overall trend of seagrass cover estimated by satellite imagery in 1990 and 2021 showed an increase of 34% at a rate of 1.3% per year. We also detected two major periods of change. Uh, so between 19, 1992 and 2000, there was a 16% decrease in coverage. And in in 2000 and 2021, there was a 50% increase in, in seagrass coverage. So here we can see in the right, uh, this is uh, two images from 1990 and, and 2021. This is a section from the middle Tampa Bay. We can see how the seagrass beds uh, just recover area here. 
um, for the the classification uh, courses were uh, usually higher than 74 percent next so if we look at closer at each tampa Bay segment we can see that the the time series data were correlated uh, the aerial and satellite time series data were correlated in each uh, tampa Bay segment but we also noted that the, the rates of change were higher for all Tampa Bay and Hillsborough Bay, which were uh, very interesting. Uh, next. So in general, the water quality uh, in Tampa Bay was improved between 1990 and 2020. We used the EPC data. So we can see how the levels of chlorophyll, nitrogen, phosphorus, and water turbidity decrease in this period. We can see uh, in these plots, uh, these are the mean values of uh, each, water quality, each water quality parameter in Tampa Bay between 1990 and 2020 for each, uh, for each segment. So basically we can see here that Hillsborough Bay and all Tampa Bay presented the, the highest levels of, of of these parameters. Uh, they also present the high turbidity and the salinity was the, the lowest in these uh, two segments in comparison to the others. So basically here we can see that uh, there was a, a pattern that we detected that we this, uh, these two segments uh, they were the most polluted ones, but they also presented the highest increasing rates in seagrass cover. So when we think about this, uh, uh, all of this makes sense when we think when we think about the light penetration because when we have like all of these particles chlorophyll and turbidity in water surface of course this is going to block the light uh, so of course all of these improvements in water quality were good for seagrasses especially in Hillsborough Bay and Old Tampa Bay so to conclude uh, Satellite mapping produces similar trends to those from area mapping. Also, we detected that Sentinel-2 uh, has had a lot of potential for doing annual seagrass mapping. Water quality improvements were related to increases in seagrass cover area, especially in Hillsborough Bay and Old Tampa Bay. Um, freely available satellite data in Google Earth Engine and open source tools enables the expansion of seagrass mapping to larger scale. Next. So this is just a bonus. This is just an example. I wanted to show that we developed a Google Earth Engine uh, app. Um, so this is public, anyone can use it. So the people can just uh, estimate and visualize all of the serious changes uh, between 1990 and 2021 in Tampa Bay. And we also included other regions such as Clearwater, St. Joseph Sound, and Sarasota Bay. Next. And finally, I want to thank to all of these institutions, organizations for providing funding, scholarships, data, and all of the resources for this study. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Luis. Next up, uh, we have Sheila Scalaro, who is the Community Program Scientist with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Sheila will be uh, speaking about piney point seagrass and macroalgae response monitoring. Take it away, Sheila. Thanks, Darcy. Good morning, everyone. Yes. Um, <laughs> be ready, Ed? Okay. Okay, so as Darcy said, my name is Sheila Scalaro. I'm the Community Program Scientist at TBEP. Um, and today I'm going to be providing a brief overview of seagrass and macroalgae uh, monitoring results that were collected in response to the 2021 Piney Point discharges. So for many of us in the Bay Area, Piney Point consumed our life for a long period of time. Um, but for those of you who are not from this area, um, just to provide some background, uh, Piney Point is a legacy phosphate mining facility that is located in Palmetto, Florida. Uh, it is directly adjacent to two aquatic preserves, as well as a long undeveloped coastline. Um, the site that, or the organization originally mining the site, 
actually went bankrupt and the site has sat inactive since about the 1990s. And because of the bankruptcy, the state was issued regulatory oversight in the early 2000s. So phosphate mining generates large quantities of phosphogypsum waste, um, which is typically stored on site in large holding ponds called gyp stacks. Um, Piney Point facility currently has three of these gyp stacks on site. And so although the site has sat inactive since about the 1990s, um, the focus has really been to contain the water and treat the water on site as to reduce any potential environmental impacts. However, as a result of seasonal rain events, uh, tropical storms, and dredged materials, there have been several emergency releases of this phosphate wastewater released into lower Tampa Bay, several of which have caused large macroalgae blooms. So the story that we all know, um, in late March of 2021, a leak was discovered in one of the holding ponds at the Piney Point facility. Within three days, the, federal, uh, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection um, had issued an emergency order allowing for the immediate discharge of water into Tampa Bay. So over the next 10 days, about 215 million gallons of processed water and seawater mix were discharged into Tampa Bay. We estimate that this is about 205 tons of total nitrogen entered lower Tampa Bay over that 10 day window. Um, since our geology is really rich in phosphates, nitrogen is the primary limiting nutrient and often can stimulate phytoplankton and macroalgae growth. So we had several major concerns at the onset of these discharges. First, this segment of the bay typically has excellent water quality and which supports very stable, healthy seagrass beds. Additionally, we have critical hard bottom sites that are located in lower Tampa Bay. These sites are essential stopover spots for many offshore fishes as they migrate in and out of Tampa Bay. And we also have the two aquatic preserves support a robust recreational fishing industry as well as commercial shellfish production. So since excess nitrogen can stimulate phytoplankton and macroalgae blooms, we decided to start monitoring seagrass and macroalgae abundance um, as part of a larger Piney Point um, environmental response monitoring effort. So from March to September, we monitored 38 50 meter long transects approximately bi-weekly. Site selection for the pink, I guess it kind of looks orange up there, but the, the pinkish orange and the green sites were driven by a plume simulation model that was developed by the Ocean Circulation Lab at USF CMS. We also included several of the TBEP annual transect, seagrass, annual seagrass transect sites um, that are shown here in blue. So for these blue sites, we have many years of baseline data dating back since to about the 1990s. So for data collection, we used a modified rapid, rapid assessment design that was originally developed for the Eyes on Seagrass Citizen Science Monitoring Program. So at every 10 meters along the transect, we dropped a 25 quarter meter squared quadrat. Um, and then within that quadrat, seagrass and macroalgae species were identified and the densities were recorded using Braun Blanquet abundances. And for reporting purposes, we aggregated the macroalgae species into major phyla. So all data analysis, um, to be totally frank, was done by Open Science Guru and TBEP program scientist um, Marcus Beck. Um, but my main takeaway here is that he converted all of the um, macroalgae and seagrass abundances into frequency occurrence. So frequency of occurrence um, is just the number of locations where a species was present divided by the total number of locations sampled. And all materials and analyses are available um, in an open science repository on our GitHub page. Additionally, data visualization products can be found um, and downloaded on the TBEP Shiny app. So just some general observations that we had during the monitoring period. Uh, macroalgae diversity and density varied up along the transects. Um, but overall, red algae was the greatest with a 57% frequency of occurrence. Um, the most common red algae that we saw included Acanthophora and several species of Gracilaria. Filamentous cyanobacteria and green algae were much less common at 13 and 7% frequency of occurrence. 
So some of the major green algae species that we saw included several species of ulva, as well as several species of colerpa. The main cyanobacteria that we were seeing is a benthic filamentous cyanobacteria called Daphis. And unfortunately we, unfortunately, we don't have any historical data to really compare these results to or these observations to. So moving on for seagrasses, there was similar abundance among the transects. However, Thalassia testudinum was dominant along most of the transects, with about 50% frequency of occurrence. Syringodium and Halidulli had similar, similar coverage at 31 and 33% frequency of occurrence. And these coverages are comparable to the historical record that we have for the annual transect sites around the discharge location. So um, macroalgae varied, um, the diversity and density varied temporally along many of the transects. So this transect provides a good representation of many of the um, or the general trend that we were seeing along many of the transects. So in April and May, uh, red algae was really the most dominant um, phyla that we observed. In late May, we began seeing large um, floating mats of cyanobacteria, particularly off Anna Maria Sound, as well as off Port Manatee. And by June, uh, the filamentous cyanobacteria was covering large portions of many of the transects. This lasted until about July. And then in July, we did have a slight uptick of uh, green algae on some of the transects. However, it was generally at low abundances. And then red algae was once again dominant towards the end of the monitoring period. For seagrasses, we had relatively consistent diversity and abundance along the transects over the time, and there was no significant changes. So to really get an understanding of the general trends in seagrass and macroalgae abundance that we observed um, throughout the monitoring period, the transects were aggregated into major areas. And so we had three major areas um, and we didn't sample any transects in area two, which is the green area um, shown in the top uh, photo. So in general, um, oh, and then this graph provides um, a general um, the general representation of the patterns that we observed in seagrass and macroalgae. So um, area one is on the left, area three is on the right, uh, macroalgae is on the top and seagrass is on the bottom. Um, so for, for macroalgae, um, we did have variability in density and diversity over time. However, um, red algae was most dominant, uh, particularly in um, April. We did see a slight decrease in red algae in July, at which the same time we saw the increase in cyanobacteria. It is important to note that area three did experience a slight higher frequency of occurrence of the filamentous cyanobacteria than area one, as Dave Tomasco was mentioning yesterday. Um, and then we also had a slight increase in green algae towards the end of the monitoring period, which was higher in area three. And for seagrasses, there was no significant variability in the density or diversity over time. Um, Thalassia testudinum was dominant, the dominant species in both areas. Um, and we did experience some slight changes in seagrass density over or in the towards the end of the monitoring period in area three, with a decrease in Thalassia and an increase in Halidulli and Syringodium. However, these changes were not considered significant. So in conclusion, there was no immediate indication of negative impacts to seagrass habitats as a result of the Piney Point discharges. However, the long-term impacts remain unknown. Seagrasses tend to take a lot longer than macroalgae does to um, really show signs of degradation. So the macroalgae, in our um, opinion, seems like it responded more dramatically, which is what we would expect. However, we don't have any long-term data to really compare these results with. So it could be that these patterns that we observed are reflective of normal natural phenology or life history changes in Tampa Bay. Bread algae like Gracilaria and Acanthophora are more common in Tampa Bay and typically occur earlier in the season than green algae.
So after we stopped monitoring, we started receiving reports of ulva blooms in the northern portions of Tampa Bay around the kitchen, as well as in the southern portions of the bay around Emerson Point. Additionally, we have started to see shifts to more macroalgae dominated estuaries, both regionally and in specific locations within Tampa Bay. And all of this points to that we need more seasonal, a more seasonal understanding of macroalgae um, diversity and abundance um, for our estuaries. This would help us have a better understanding of our estuaries and to be able to respond more effectively to potential um, early signs of degradation. So we've had many of you in this room have helped to make significant strides and significant improvements in estuaries regionally. And we really need to renew our commitment to reducing nutrient input into Tampa Bay and regionally. And we really need to paddle faster to continue to protect and restore our estuaries. Thank you. Oh, before I go, I just wanna say a huge shout out to all the partners that made this happen, Pinellas County, um, EPC, Tampa Bay Watch. Thank you guys. Okay, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, next up on the docket is uh, yours truly. Um, and I'm glad that Sheila went first because um, that was a really excellent intro to my presentation. So I'm gonna turn this off and stand up. All right, um, so I'm here this morning to give kind of a, a meta presentation about a different conference. Um, how many of you here in the audience attended the Florida Macroalgae virtual workshops last spring? Okay, um, cool. So that means there are several of you in the audience that this is gonna be new info for, which is awesome. I was a little worried about that. So um, I am presenting this on behalf of our steering committee uh, for the workshops, which included all four of the Florida Peninsula NEPs, as well as the St. Johns River and Southwest Florida Water Management Districts, Harbor Branch Oceanographic um, Laboratory, as well as Florida Sea Grant. So um, next, please. Uh, we held a set of, of three half-day workshops in March and April 2021. Um, we, uh, the, the goals of the workshop were to convene folks to talk about macroalgae specifically, um, you know, of their own merit. Uh, to build a shared understanding of how these macroalgae are um, influencing our estuaries and to start connecting people across systems to try to see if we could um, build shared monitoring and management priorities. Uh, we had a pretty good attendance from across the state. We attracted almost 250 attendees uh, and we were pretty pleased by the response, I think. We felt like this was uh, an indication of how timely this information was. Um, and we tried pretty hard to engage people um, in the virtual workshops. You know, of course, engaging folks virtually can be challenging, but we did the best we could with some participatory mapping through uh, breakout sessions for each of the Florida NEP sessions. So you can see that on the right there. Um, we actually used Google Jamboard um, and had people break out into geographic sessions and mark up these maps with information that they had about macroalgae from their estuaries. So. Um, we had people who were scientists and managers, of course, but we also had a good number of general public who attended this presentation. Um, so these maps are kind of really interesting um, uh, collections of information from people um, all across the stakeholders. Uh, next, please. So uh, why did we choose to have this macroalgae workshop and, and why was spring 2021 a timely, uh, timely era for it? Next, please. First off, um, macroalgae are important. We wanted to start off the workshop uh, with, with this information because um, I think often when we're talking about macroalgae in our estuaries, it's for negative reasons. Um, and we wanted to start off with some of the positive sides of, of macroalgae and recognizing how important they are to our estuary systems, that they're uh, primary producers, sometimes they're the dominant primary producers. They're important parts of our food webs. They provide habitat for other organisms. Um, there are key participants in nutrient cycling, which um, ended up being a really important part of these workshops. Um, they help produce sediment and the attached versions are important for sediment stability. And they also have a lot of economic value. Um, so, uh, you know, we wanted to acknowledge these uh, aspects of macroalgae in our estuaries while 
thinking about the fact that globally macroalgae abundance is increasing and we've seen that as well in our Florida estuaries. Next please. The second reason we felt like this was timely and important is that macroalgae are both not well understood and misunderstood. Um, kind of a different nuance there, but in terms of being not well understood, um, we have a number of monitoring gaps. Compared to seagrass and phytoplankton, macroalgae can be pretty challenging to monitor, um, especially drift macroalgae, which were the main focus of this workshop. They tend to not stay in one place. Um, and so they're not as predictable in terms of how well, um, how easy they are to monitor. They're also kind of taxonomically all over the place. There's a lot of different types. And in terms of setting up, for example, community monitoring programs, um, that can be a challenge because it's not as easy to teach folks about the types of macroalgae compared to, for example, the seven species of seagrass that we have in Florida. Um, so that's kind of on the not well understood side. In terms of being misunderstood, um, you know, public perception of macroalgae seaweeds is almost uniformly bad. Um, I, uh, you know, fishers especially will come up with some pretty fun names for macroalgae like snotgrass and I think Dave yesterday called it fireweed. fireweed. Um, and so I looked up snotgrass online to see if I could find some cool image to include and this is what came up. Um, these are some interesting statues that a, a French artist made of um, mud and algae from the swamp behind her house. So anyway, this is this is kind of like what the public perception of macroalgae and seaweed is. And so this makes it challenging to put a, to put out a nuanced message about what they mean for our estuaries. And then finally, that on the right is actually Sheila um, in Sarasota Bay. Uh, there are a lot of knowledge gaps about macroalgae in Florida estuaries and globally. And we'll get into that more later, but those knowledge gaps can make it um, challenging to manage manage these blooms. Next, please. Um, but at the same time, we as the steering committee, and I think the participants felt that macroalgae might help us solve the puzzle of some of these water quality woes that we see. Um, this uh, this, gra this graphic from uh, Burkholder et al. 2007 really helped us kind of think through how we wanted to present this information during the workshop. Um, that macroalgae are really important players in nutrient cycling in our estuaries, but players that we don't necessarily understand quite as well as the seagrass uh, phytoplankton paradigm. So we wanted to talk through that as a group, get some experts together and see if we could uh, piece through this graphic a little bit more. Next, please. So uh, we held three half day workshops. It was a lot of fun. Um, we had expert presenters, we had, um, uh, we had some, some good interactive participation. So what did we learn? Next. Uh, first off, no surprise to those of us in this room, pollution and changing hydrology are among the primary drivers of blooms. Um, we ended up creating this infographic um, after the workshop to illustrate uh, the information that all of the presenters um, showed us over those three days um, between land practices, urbanization, um, uh, nutrient pollution from agriculture, air pollution, stormwater runoff. Um, all of these things are, of course, impacting our estuaries and leading in, in different ways to macroalgae blooms. And these drivers vary across estuary systems and they vary temporally. Um, and, you know, we heard this during the workshop and we feel that it's, it's important to keep following up on this as well. Next, please. Uh, we also learned that we can learn from each other and we don't need to reinvent the wheel necessarily. Um, all four of the Florida estuary systems that presented had experiences to share. And I think if we did this workshop again, we would have even more information to share with each other, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of monitoring, mapping, and managing macroalgae blooms in Florida. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we heard from Roger Johansson about the infamous macroalgae blooms in Tampa Bay that indirectly led to the formation of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Uh, yesterday, Chris, Anastasio, and Dave uh, Tomasco gave presentations about uh, blooms in Sarasota and uh, Charlotte Harbor. And uh, we also heard from presenters who uh, talked to us about other, other parts of the world. So Newport Bay, California um, has a great story about macroalgae management. Um, the Long Island Sound um, up in the Northeast, as well as Kings Bay here in Florida. And that was a freshwater system. So uh, we tried to pull knowledge uh, from around the country to better understand what's happening here in our state. Next, please. I think one of the most important outcomes of the workshop is that we highlighted that community science programs do collect valuable data and they should be expanded. 
Um, so in my experience doing public outreach, I find that sadly a lot of uh, community science programs, um, the data maybe aren't used to the extent that they could be. And maybe that's because they're not high enough quality. Maybe it's because they're not designed uh, well enough to be to be part of uh, of, of science programs. But um, Betty Stogler, who was formerly with uh, Florida Sea Grant and uh, is now with NOAA, she created a program called Eyes on Seagrass that Sheila referenced um, in Charlotte Harbor starting in 2019. Um, this is a really amazing community science program. Uh, folks go out into the estuary and they do the kind of usual percent cover um, that you would expect, but they also, uh, interestingly, they um, they actually uh, determine the biomass of the macroalgae that they find in their transects. So that can help give us a window into uh, some of those nutrient cycling questions that we have, because we can calculate how much, uh, excuse me, how much nutrient biomass is caught up in, in that algae. And so uh, Betty gave a great presentation about that. And um, as a result of this, we've actually expanded uh, her Eyes on Seagrass program up through uh, Sarasota Bay into Anna Maria Sound. So now twice a year we have uh, community science monitoring of macroalgae going on from Charlotte Harbor up through Anna Maria Sound. And I know there was a lot of interest from folks um, at the workshop to expand that even further. And as Sheila just told you, the, the methods um, from the Eyes on Seagrass program were used to help monitor the Piney Point event as well. Um, so I felt like this was a really important outcome. Um, because you know this workshop, we're telling people we need to we need to monitor macroalgae. They're really important, but we all know that our monitoring programs, uh, our professional monitoring programs, are really maxed out in a lot of ways, and we didn't feel like we could ask for more and more parameters to be added to those, at least in the Sarasota Bay area. And so this is an inexpensive way to get the data that we needed. Um, this is an inexpensive way to get the data that we needed. And um, it also is a really amazing public engagement tool because it helps us communicate some of that nuance about macroalgae. If you think back to that slide, macroalgae are, are not well understood and also misunderstood. Um, it helps us work through some of that misunderstanding because um, sometimes folks will go out there, they find you know relatively little macroalgae and it's almost like they're disappointed, um, but it's an opportunity for us to uh, communicate with them about how macroalgae are also important parts of our ecosystems. Uh, next, please. So a lot of the workshop really focused on what we have left to learn and what our research questions are. Next, please. Uh, there are a lot of really cool questions left to investigate. I know this slide might be a little bit unsatisfying, but these are some of the questions that we have. Um, and some of them are pretty basic, um, but you know there was a lot of interest in, in if we could develop macroalgae as useful indicators of eutrophication in our systems, um, in addition to the indicators of seagrass and phytoplankton. Uh, there was a lot of interest in cyanobacteria because we don't, we, we, they tend to be included in the same monitoring programs as macroalgae, but we don't know if they're really responding in the same ways uh, that, that attached and drift macroalgae are. Uh, we're also curious about how macroalgae relate to other primary producers. Um, and how the ecosystem services of those drift and attached macroalgae differ from those of seagrasses. Um, like Sheila mentioned in her presentation, we're starting to see attached macroalgae um, replace a lot of areas that used to be continuous seagrass beds in, um, in our Southwest Florida estuaries. And there are a lot of questions about whether or not their ecosystem services are the same, um, especially when it comes to wildlife that forage on seagrass. Um, and then finally, you know, we're very curious about what kind of roles climate change might play in driving these blooms as well. Next, please. So in terms of outcomes, um, you know, we, I think the most important one was that uh, we felt like this inspired folks to think clearly about macroalgae um, as important indicators in our systems and start dedicating some time and effort to them. Um, we had some communication next steps um, to, to keep developing those indicators. Um, to hold more workshops and working groups to keep the momentum running. Um, we want to improve uh, and expand existing monitoring programs and develop monitoring programs in areas that lack data. Uh, of course, we want to compare that data that we do have across systems, um, research drivers and consequences that are unique to each estuary. And in terms of management and policy, um, you know, work on reducing nutrient loads and developing management recommendations for those blooms. Should we be removing macroalgae blooms like we do remove uh, dead fish, things like that. Um, next, please. 
that is all I had for you today. Um, I want to give a huge thanks to our steering committee whose names are listed here. Um, you know, it was a real pleasure to work with all of these people, um, really, really knowledgeable managers and scientists on putting together this workshop. Um, we have all of the presentations available to view online and uh, as well as the workshop report. And my contact information is there. Um, and with that, I think I will wrap it up. Thank you very much. Okay, so coming up to the stage is Renee Price. Uh, Renee is with Atkins, and let me get your presentation title here. Renee will be talking to us about St. Joseph Bay seagrass restoration, a tale of 43,954 sediment tubes. Thanks, Renee. Thank you, Darcy. Um, good morning and happy Friday, everybody. I'm really excited to be here to talk about this opportunity I had the chance to work on. I'm gonna to attempt to give you guys a brief overview in 12 minutes, but as I'll admit, and many of you know, I can talk to you about this probably for a whole day. Um, so next, please, Ed. So our story begins in uh, Northwest Florida, where it's been observed that there's significant scarring in some of our bay areas um, due to recreational boaters. There's a lot of shallow, shallow depth constrained areas that are have very um, big tidal swings. We're finding that especially in areas where there are high percentages of boat rentals, we're seeing a lot of environmental degradation. There's some environmental and ecological consequences to the prop scarring. We're seeing loss of valuable estuarine habitat, um, a lot of sediment, destabilization, and a lot of impacts to benthic fauna. Next, please. So specifically how this affects seagrass is we have kind of two things that are happening. We can have a removal of the above ground biomass, and we also have damage to the root systems and the rhizomes. This um, results in increased susceptibility to storms and other types of erosion. It's also resulting in resuspension of sediments in the water column. We're also finding based on literature that um, scars that are over six inches in depth are really um, affecting the seagrass's ability to regenerate and is um, affecting the overall efficacy of the uh, meadows. Next, please. So for this particular effort, um, our project objectives were um, a part of the Deepwater Horizon Natural Resources Damage Assessment Early Restoration Program, um, which funding is provided to use um, novel techniques to do restoration efforts. So we did a multi-phase restoration project um, to map, assess, and quantify sediment loss in three aquatic preserves up in Northern Florida that are identified on this map. We have St. Andrew State Park, St. Joseph Bay, and Alligator Harbor, which are all kind of in the area of Apalachicola. Um, specifically for St. Joe Bay, we developed and implemented a res restoration strategy to discuss the, or to address the propeller scar impacts in St. Joseph Bay, as well as restore two acres of scarred seagrass habitat within the preserve. Our target species for this initiative was Thalassia due to the slower growth um, that can be seen and would be impacted um, by the uh, prop scars. Next, please. So to do this as part of our novel innovation um, and the specs provided by the client, we were gonna use sediment tubes to um, help fill in these prop scars. So a typical sediment tube is um, duck canvas. It has a five ply jute cord um, to tie off the end, make sure all that sediment stays in there. Um, and the selected product that we ended up with seven ounce cotton duck fabric settled on nine by 36 inch dimensions um, for this project. Go ahead, next, please. Um, so the benefits of sediment tube restoration in this type of application is that sediment tubes kind of help coax the grass along into recolonizing these areas. So by placing the sediment tube, you restore the um, ambient grade, which allows the root growth or promotes root growth um, on the estuary bottom. The rhizomes will um, penetrate into the tube. Eventually, the cotton fiber will decompose, usually in about a six month time frame. And this results in sediment stabilization and allowing the seagrass to cross these great canyons as it sees or is seen to them. Next, please. So for this project, I'm gonna to try to highlight the six main phases that um, we went through over the process of a few years, just to give you guys a general idea um, of what we did out there. So the first step was aerial imagery collection. Uh, we worked with Survey and Mapping, also known as SAM, um, to work on this part of the project. Again, this is one of the novel approaches that were prescribed in the solicitation by the client, um, using the use of drones um, to make this part of the project happen. So we used um, bird's eye view aerobatics Firefly 6 Pros with Sony Alpha 6000 digital single um, lens reflex camera systems. 
Um, the flights were conducted no more than 400 feet above ground surface. Um, they used RTK differential GPS, cor GPS correction, and um, we used the installation of six aerial targets to help keep us on track. The second phase of this project was imagery analysis and mapping, where we used heads-up photo interpretation. Um, we looked for two things during this exercise, and that was depth and intensity of the scars that we were seeing in St. Joseph Bay. So for the evaluation of scars versus trims, looking at the depth, we did three bins or types. Um, type one was partial loss of shoot biomass, which we also refer to as a trim. Type two was complete um, removal of above ground biomass, but you'd still have the rhizomes intact. And then type three, which is complete loss to seagrass and sediment below the rhizosphere. So usually when you see the aerial photos and can see that bright sand signature, that's what you're seeing is this type three. We also looked at scarring intensity designations or kind of through a hotspot analysis to figure out um, based on the literature reviews by Sargent, um, what type of, or what intensity of scars were we looking at? So we've been these into light scarring of 5% or less, moderate scarring of 5 to 20%, and then heavy or severe scarring would be 20% or greater um, prop scars in a potential restoration area. So in total, we had 701 scars mapped, totaling 2.1 um, acres of heavy to severe scarring is what we chose to um, target as a priority for this restoration. So after um, viewing everything a desktop, we got our feet on the ground and our boots wet by doing some ground truthing and uh, data collection. We started with doing an accuracy assessment, which included both spatial and thematic accuracy checks uh, while in the field. We also randomly selected um, a group of scars throughout the entire aquatic preserve to get an idea of their dimensions. What type of widths are we looking at? What type of depths are we looking at? And how are we going to use these measurements to determine which areas are priority and what size sediment tubes we need? We also discussed the restoration priority once we had you know, um, a full-on visual. So we looked at water depth, proximity to channels, species, depth of scars, and scarring intensity to identify potential restoration areas and find that Goldilocks sweet spot where it's an area that is going to need some assistance, but it's not going to be continually impacted and prohibit the restoration to actually take into effect. Um, also, as part of this exercise, we explored um, the use of sediment tubes versus naked fill or seeded tubes, um, and whether we were going to do a variety of treatments to a variety of different types of scars based on that intensity and depth. Um, and what we decided was that due to the um, really sad number of really severe scars that we were going to tailor this restoration to just address those impacts. Um, lastly, we collect sediment samples um, from the random selected scars. We did a grain size analysis to make sure that the native soil was matching the source soil that we were going to be placing inside the sediment tubes to try to recreate the um, natural environment as much as possible. So the next phase of this project, it required um, permitting. So just kind of as a real quick overview, we did um, obtain an FDEP ERP permit. Um, we also had a nationwide um, permit 27 from the U.S. Army Corps and a JAXPO programmatic permit. And I think one of the biggest take-homes and highlights of the JAXPO was to restore that ambient grade was one of our number one targets. So the implementation phase, one of my favorite phases, because as I like to say, you never have a bad day when you're out on a boat. Um, so the... The implementation phase started with um, prop scar marking. <laughs> a boat that's working when you're not stuck and there's no storms <laughs> or hurricanes <laughs> and a good tide. <laughs> um, so the propeller scar marking, um, we started with confirming the restoration suitability of the scar, getting out of the boat, making sure it met those depth and width parameters that we were looking for. We'd install a PVC pole to denote the location. And we also had a flagging system. One flag, the scar is ready to go. Two flags, the scar has been restored and ready for QC. Three flags, the scar has been QC'd and ready for client verification and validation. Um, we also labeled each pole and gave each scar its very own name. Um, so vessel loading and deployment, um, we had some land side support where you can see here um, sediment tubes were loaded um, across the way. Um, our contractor um, came up with these really great systems of tubes um, and it became a race between amongst his uh, team of who could fill as many tubes as fast as possible. And that was a very good uh, motivation. Um, as you can see here, then we also in the bottom photo um, would load barges to have them floated out to the restoration areas and have ample amount of sediment tubes available for the folks to come and um, put them in. So for sediment tube deployment, um, we had folks in the water um, and they would take a tube, 
shake it out to make sure all the sediment is evenly um, displaced throughout it. Again, ambient grade even is what we're looking for, Florida flat. Um, so we would tuck the ends of that jute cord to make sure that the tubes could um, butt up against each other. Um, again, making that kind of seamless flat um, surface. Um, the tubes would be placed into prop scars where all the macro algae or any sort of marine debris that would be there would be cleared out. The tube would be placed in um, and then it would be ready for a QC. Um, for the QC, um, we took a video transect of most of the scars. Um, all the scars have representative photos, um, GPS point and a polyline feature where we walked each scar. So we have all of them um, mapped out. Um, and lastly, we did a data sheet or kind of QA checklist um, using survey one, two, three in the field to make sure that all the parameters and quality uh, marks that we needed were um, met and as well as collect all of our kind of um, background data for each of those scars. So in summary, we um, implemented 43,954 sediment tubes across 11 potential restoration areas in St. Joe Bay. Um, this totaled 379 prop scars. And if you squish all those scars together, it equates to over just about two acres. Or if you line them all up one by one, it's almost 25 miles of prop scars that were restored during this effort. Um, so we have currently moved into the monitoring phase, or our client DP has moved in the monitoring phase. So one of the silver linings of COVID is now you guys are going to be able to see what's happening out there a year later. Um, the initial monitoring has started. Our performance standard is um, a level three on the Braun Blanquette um, level after two growing seasons. Um, to date, 75% of the restored scars um, have been monitored. 48% of these have a score of one or higher. 14% have already met the restoration criteria of having a three or higher. Um, we have noticed some areas of halidulia recruitment in um, the PSR1, um, which is a little interesting plot twist. Um, and we also had some urchin, urchin predation that's completely denuded some of the seagrass areas to the south of the preserve. Um, and again, that's also a little plot twist um, that has kind of come our way. So we'll have to navigate those challenges next. Um, so lastly, I'd like to acknowledge um, all of the folks who made this Herculean effort possible. Um, we are partners with DEP. Um, we had Pierre Spirit and Jonathan Brocker um, who were instrumental in this effort. Um, we also had teamed with RPI um, up in Tallahassee. So some of you might be familiar with Scott Zingle and Hal Fravel. Um, Loftus Marine, who is our Marine contractor, um, as well as um, our Atkins staff who were willing to become honorary members of Port St. Joe community um, over the six month period um, and put in a lot of uh, sweat equity. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Renee. Um, and next, we, we wanna to apologize to Carolyn Garrity with the Morro Bay National Estuary Program. She was gonna be next up, but um, we're not gonna be able to have her presentation today. So, um, I, it, Jill, are you online and ready? Yes, I am. Okay, um, this is Jill Carr uh, joining us online with the Mass Bays National Estuary Partnership. And Jill will be presenting new approaches in seagrass mapping engaging community scientists and assessing remote sensing accuracy. Take it away, Jill. Thanks so much. Yes, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you, even, even though virtually. Uh, Mass Bays has been very busy with seagrass work, and today I'll highlight two new approaches we've taken to mapping our local seagrass. Uh, we really just have one primary species, and that's eelgrass or Zostra marina. Next. The first half of my talk starts with a familiar and unfortunate story of loss. The Duxbury, Kingston, Plymouth embayment that you see here sits about 30 miles south of Boston and has experienced severe eelgrass declines since the onset of our DEP's aerial mapping program in 1995. In the 22-year period shown across these maps, the embayment lost 77% of its eelgrass extent, which is over 3,200 acres. Apologies, that 50% figure at the top is an understatement. An evaluation of the possible causative factors was conducted several years back, but I won't be focusing on that in today's talk. In Massachusetts, the DEP mapping program updates their eelgrass maps every five years, so you could see how in another couple of mapping cycles, the remaining eelgrass in this embayment might be gone completely, which underscores a need for higher temporal and spatial resolution data on eelgrass presence, absence, and health to better understand what's happening here. Next. 
Fortunately, we had a highly motivated and engaged local watershed group interested in taking on a monitoring effort. So we partnered up with them as well as with our state fisheries agency with a goal of developing a protocol that addressed changes across a large spatial scale, didn't require divers, keeping in mind that eelgrass is subtital here, and was citizen science friendly. So we used input from locals and eelgrass experts to guide our protocol, tested countless gear types and configurations, conducted a stratified random site selection process, and finally we were ready to pilot test the protocol in 2018. Next. In a nutshell, the protocol involves sending out crews of volunteer scientists aboard motorized boats to pre-selected sites across the embayment. At each site, a standardized photo quadrat rigged with an underwater live feed camera is deployed off the four corners of the boat to create sample replicates. The video feed from the camera is viewed in real time at the surface, where volunteers record eelgrass percent cover, sediment type, and other observations. So far, the protocol has been implemented in a multi-day blitz format, hitting all sites during a three to five day stretch in late August. Next. At a subset of the stations, several shoots are collected either by snorkelers in the water or by using a lightweight anchor. These samples are assessed for leaf area index, epiphyte coverage, and wasting disease. The same sites are resampled each year at the same time of year. Data are logged in real time in a web app developed for the protocol called IC Grass, which uh, is it's a more recent development that I'll talk more about in a moment. And in the embayment where this was piloted, the watershed group has now coordinated four years of the survey. Next. So here's an example of the variety of conditions that can be observed in the photo quadrats. We found that having the ability to assess photos in real time made the experience more rewarding for volunteers but also helped avoid poor image quality or camera issues that can sometimes happen and go undetected until you're processing the images in the lab. So in these images, you can spot eelgrass of varying density in three of the frames. And in the other frames, you can see corda algae, shell hash, and a dense muscle bed uh, that has a rock crab and spider crab sort of making their way into the shot. Next. In terms of results, Recall on the left where eelgrass still remained as of the 2017 aerial survey. The citizen science survey data on the right show numerous sites lost eelgrass over the four year sampling period between 2018 and 2021, indicated by the black X's. Some sites are showing signs of stress and possible loss where the presence absence ratio changes from year to year. That's shown in light green and other sites have been pretty persistent across the years in dark green. So as you can see, the protocol was able to inform us of changing conditions at a higher temporal resolution than the existing aerial program. Next. We can also glean some insights about plant health by looking at KD derived from Secchi depth that's in the center panel and epiphyte coverage that's on the right, both of which seem to be in worse shape further down in the lower part of the embayment, which is Plymouth Harbor. I don't have graphics ready to share for leaf area index or wasting disease trends, but the watershed group leading the work is going to be preparing a report soon and um, I can share that out and keep an eye out for that. Next. Now I'd like to make a quick plug for the data collection app I mentioned earlier, IC Grass. Uh, while this was intended initially um, for the citizen science protocol, we're finding it has really great utility beyond that and has been useful for professional scientists here in Massachusetts too. It's open access and free for all to use, so I wanted to share it here today in case it's helpful to anyone. Within the app, all of your survey trips are organized and you can have unlimited stations logged within each trip. On the top right, this is the screen where you fill in your trip details like your boat crew, date, etc. And then once you add a station to your trip, the menu on the bottom right opens and you can fill in station info, your location, which includes an automatic ping of a lat long directly from your phone, weather information, your Secchi depth recordings, and drop frame recordings. The data collected for a drop frame are shown in the callout box and includes sediment, eelgrass percent cover, but really this could be any seagrass percent cover, photo timestamp information, which will automatically populate if you check that little box, and a field for notes. There are additional screens for recording the shoot sample data like leaf area index and wasting disease, but for now I'll just leave you with um, this much. Next. We now have a very simple map dashboard available too, and that's linked below. So folks can go online and see uh, where the data are being collected within the app, 
who's doing the work, and uh, users can run some very simple filters to view presence absence data. And in terms of next steps for this work, uh, we have several volunteer groups interested in starting to use the protocol. So we feel it's a success story and can really help fill um, the need for more frequent eelgrass data up here. Next. So now completely switching gears, I'm going to give uh, a little teaser for a new NOAA funded mapping project that we're leading. Next. And we all know that remote sensing is uh, the, one of the most e efficient ways of mapping seagrasses. Uh, but that the various methods have different trade-offs in terms of scale, image resolution, cost, logistics, and the level of detail provided. However, uh, the detection capabilities of each method are poorly understood, at least up in the Northeast in turbid waters. For example, can aerial surveys reliably detect eelgrass at, say, 25% cover, or how about 10% cover? Next. And if you could just do three clicks. Thanks. The problem is, um, at least up here, we have a very heavy reliance on remotely sensed eelgrass data in the review of project siting. Things like underwater cable and pipeline trenching, dredging, dock and pier projects, these all rely on these remote sensing surveys to evaluate impacts. Further, resource managers and planners also use remote sensing data to assess trends and water body health. And while we feel comfortable in the location of dense contiguous meadows that are easily visible in the imagery, our confidence is much lower at the meadow's edge. Ultimately, if our mapping programs are missing parts of the meadow, these areas are likely receiving inadequate protection and there's a risk of net loss. And I can imagine most people in this session can think of examples where better mapping data and a better understanding of method limitations would have resulted in fewer impacts. Next. Um, just do a bunch of clicks here, about nine clicks. The approach of the project involves collecting imagery using four remote survey methods, including satellite, airplane, drone, and side scan sonar, all within the same two week period, along with high resolution diver transect surveys across the meadow's edge. We'll study both the shallow and deep edges at five sites in Massachusetts this coming May. Remote imagery will be photo interpreted for eelgrass using a heads up approach. And then by comparing delineations of the remote survey data against the diver transects, we'll be able to determine the detection error for each method or how far off the remotely sensed edge was compared to the diver measured edge, as well as describe how eelgrass percent cover affects detectability for each method. The study will allow us to generate proposed management buffers that could be applied to maps generated from each method and will also help us to develop a process for integrating data collected from the different sources. This may even have the added benefit of making historical survey data more usable. We plan to generate new eelgrass maps for the study sites, and I want to note that we have a lot of wonderful agency and NGO partners on the project with an overarching goal of building capacity for this type of work. Next. A couple clicks, please. In closing, uh, I realize this was a lot to cover here, so please feel free to get in touch if we have shared interests. Um, please do take advantage of the IC Grass app and the Citizen Science Protocol if that can be helpful in your region. As I showed, it can be used to detect changing conditions and can gain a lot of momentum at the community level. And to echo Darcy's point earlier this morning, um, these citizen programs can really contribute such valuable data to the monitoring universe, so uh, we'd really like to see them expanded as well. I'm sure I'll be back next year to discuss the mapping project results, but uh, feel free to follow along with us if you're interested. I can drop the link to that project's website in the chat box in just a minute. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Jill. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, um, so please feel free to bring them on up. Bring them on up. Raise your hands, whatever we're doing. Uh, my question's for Louise about the uh, seagrass or the seagrass mapping in terms of what were your ac what was your accuracy of the model for looking at specific point change? Uh, did it match what the in situ surveys were finding, or was it more of a under overestimation? Uh, 
Do you mean by looking at a specific point in the in the map? Well, when you yeah, when you map it, uh, the locations where you detected gain or loss, did that mirror the in situ surveys, uh, the diver surveys? Yeah, well, we didn't we didn't uh, do like a currency for a spatial uh, distribution, uh, but when we when we compare like visually this uh, the spatial distribution between the uh, satellite, the uh, seagrass mapping doing uh, with using satellite images and those by the Southwest Florida Water Management District, we can see that those distributions were pretty similar. Sometimes it's not the same because with the satellite images, we have like these pixels, but the other product is more like uh, smooth so, because this is just like vectors. So it's uh, there are some uh, differences there, but we use the other uh, accuracy that is just help us to to measure how good is is the model. Hi, Lewis, I have a question for you as well. Um, at the Water Management District, we use a six inch res uh, pixel resolution. I know you mentioned it was a 30 meter resolution. Um, how is that, uh, was it able to distinguish between the differences of seagrass versus macroalgae? Because I know even we were using a one foot resolution and that wasn't even clear enough and now we're on six inch. So I just wanted to know how did you deal with that, um, trying to make that distinguishing, um, distinguishing between macroalgae versus seagrass? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, these are some of the limitations of the of the satellite imager, images because if we use a uh, landsat of course we have a 30 meters pixel which is uh, huge this is like 900 square meters right so in that uh, in that pixel we can find a lot of stuff but we are we were only focused on what was the dominant um substrate this so um for that we didn't just we, we didn't compare like even separate astrology and grasses, but it was really helpful by the program uh, data from the transits and also the Sowers uh, Florida uh, management uh, district data. Um, and sometimes we were able to see like some uh, differences, some visual differences between the macroalgae and seagrasses. Macroalgae is very uh, green, it's dark green and seagrasses are usually in like a brown color. So yeah, so uh, for example, after the classifications, we got some areas classified, uh, some macroalgae areas classified as, as seagrasses. So for for example, in those cases, we just, uh, using all of this information, the in-situ information, we just uh, max that out. Hi, I have a question for Darcy. Um, did you have any sort of QA on your citizen science? Yeah, thank you for uh, bringing that up because it's it's something I forgot to mention. Actually, uh, we did put together a quality assurance project plan for uh, the Eyes on Seagrass program. Um, it was the methods were developed by Betty Stogler at Florida Sea Grant, and then um, we ended up putting together a QA plan on that. Um, and so that that document has a bunch of the info about how we did the the QA on the data that the citizens uh, collected. And they submitted their macroalgae samples to us as well. So we were able to um, kind of QA those like very rudimentary IDs that they did on some of them. Thank you. And that that document is available to anyone um, who's interested in implementing that program. You know, we wrote it for Sarasota Bay, but I think it would be really easy to edit it and um, make it usable for really any estuary. So um, if you're interested, please just contact me. So we're gonna take Aaron Brown, then Tom Ash, then we have several questions in the chat that we're gonna take next. Hi, uh, Aaron Brown, University of Tampa. Renee, I have a question about the restoration in St. Joseph Sound. You said that you completed around 25,000. St. Joseph Bay, excuse me, <laughs> sorry. 25 uh, miles of restoration. Can you quantify that by an area and what like that cost was? Did you look at that for a, a cost per unit acre or hectare at the end of the day? Um, I unfortunately do not know the cost per unit here um, at the end of the day. I do know like combined again, it was like about the two acres when you squish all the prop scars together. But, okay. But it's a good question. All right, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, my question is for Jill. Um, 
I'm, I'm really fascinated by the the camera setup and the rig that you guys used for remote uh, sensing from the up to the boat. Can you describe that a little better? Believe it or not, there are still days and even in Florida where you don't want to actually get in the water. Um, but I, I I really like that setup, and I was curious of what kind of camera equipment you use. Sure. Yeah. Um, the the camera itself is called a splash cam. Um, it, it's it's really pretty uh, robust and rugged. Um, I will say though that after a couple years of a, a citizen science group using it, it does tend to need some tuning up and some replacement parts. But it's it's a pretty reliable unit, and it gets attached to a um, quarter meter uh, quadrat that's the size of the bottom quadrat that's on the seafloor which stands about a meter tall so it um, the method doesn't work real well if you're in water that's around a meter or less you'd need to find some shorter system or maybe use a, a whole scale the whole thing down to a smaller quadrat but it, it works really nicely and that splash cam setup comes with the um, the box with the screen as well so that's all um, kind of retail. You, you buy it just like that. And we've been very happy with it. So Jill, for the benefit of the folks in the room, Dave Tomasco asked you a question in the chat, which was, there's been work in Florida that shows that traditional mapping only picks up seagrass with the Braun Blanquet score of about two. There's more seagrass than what is mapped at the deep edge. Do you expect something similar in Mass Bay? Yeah, yeah, and I was actually surprised that um, that there's that much um, of error in Florida, given your, your better, I'm just assuming here, your better uh, water clarity. Um, but we expect to have um, a, lot, a lot of lower density eelgrass areas missed, both at the shallow edge and at the deep edge, just, um, just because of our depth. Our eelgrass grows a whole lot deeper here, you know, can be between um, a couple meters all the way up to, to um, 10 or 15 meters. So it grows very deep and we do have darker, turbid, more turbid waters uh, that are less visible with aerial imagery. So we are expecting to see, um, you know, that, that uh, areas are not included in the current mapping programs. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence of that. There's been a lot of um, kind of opportunistic field days where you're out sort of diving or doing work and you're like, oh, this isn't even on, you know, the map has this way off. This goes for hundreds of feet beyond uh, where the DEP map is. So. We're open to, you know, with a scientifically robust method, um, make that uh, that statement more um, official <laughs> so that we could then provide some guidance to the state mapping programs and, and all the folks that use their data. Thank you. And for this question is for Renee. This is from Pam DeBona from MassBays. She wants to know if you can talk about any preventative measures that you have in place to keep prop damage to a minimum, like education, outreach campaigns, et cetera. Um, yes, that's actually a really good question and something that we had discussed with um, DEP. Um, a lot of kind of what we were dealing with is right on the heels of Hurricane Michael. We'd actually slated this restoration to start earlier um, and had to cut off because of that and then the beginning of COVID. Um, but at one point in time, they did have informational kiosks available at major launch points that launch points throughout um, St. Joseph Bay. But that is one of the things that um, the aquatic preserve manager in that area is interested in exploring um, other ways to make that information readily available, um, especially to people who rent boats and aren't as familiar with the bathymetry as like the local fishermen who can go out at night in the total pitch black um, and know exactly where to go. So I think that that's definitely an area that we know needs attention um, and they're hoping to uh, develop a strategy or develop a strategy for that um, in the future. Thank you. We have other questions in the room? I have a couple myself. So for, for Darcy and for Sheila, you know, we already ask a lot of our partners to help us monitor seagrass, and now we're talking about helping getting a baseline for macroalgae. And in Sarasota Bay, you all are doing it largely with the support of volunteers. Can you talk a little bit about how we continue to cobble together and can keep growing our understanding of these estuaries um, with the limited resources that we all have? What are the opportunities for ways that we can we can do this work? Sure, I'll take a first stab at it. Um, well, yeah, like Darcy said, um, citizen scientists can provide a ton of valuable um, data and information, but um, macroalgae is, there's a ton of different species, especially the reds, and they all look exactly the same. Um, so I think we would have to, I think we could 
leverage that citizen science support. We would just have to really work with them and build a committed team um, to adopt certain sites so that we could provide ample training to them. Um, I also think that we could leverage some of um, the other data that maybe isn't being used, like uh, the FWC, their Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. They're out on the water every month going to different sites, pulling these huge nets, and they pull out a ton of bycatch and um, in the ways of like drift algae. And they, they, they make note of it, but it hasn't really been um, analyzed or opened up and really explored. And I think that's something that we is already being collected that we could potentially use to help kind of cobble together these different resources to build a better baseline information or baseline data set. Yeah, Sheila, I totally agree. And thank you for bringing up the FIM monitoring because um, I think that is a really uh, potentially useful uh, piece of information in this puzzle. Um, and they've been collecting it for so long that it can, you know, even though Eyes on Seagrass really only started monitoring a couple of years ago, um, you know, we can piece things together from prior years. Um, and what I was going to mention is that, um, you know, even if we can't add parameters, I think sometimes there are times when we can maybe just tweak slightly what we're doing to get the information that we need. So, for example, we partner with Sarasota County on their community science monitoring program called um, this the Seagrass Survey. Um, and they were collecting macro algae data in a slightly different way. Um, and we were able to work with them to get it collected in a way that we could use it in the same way that we use Eyes on Seagrass. So I think it's, you know, working collaboratively with folks that are doing different kinds of monitoring, be it not exactly what you need and seeing if there are ways that you can work together um, to, you know, to get what you need. And the last thing I'll mention about that is, sorry, really quick, um, is that uh, I, I did want to say that we are using those data that the citizens uh, collect in our water quality report card for Sarasota Bay. So up in um, our, our first one that um, our director Dave Tomasco produced um, only included macroalgae data for Sarasota County because they monitor macroalgae for their um, for their stormwater monitoring program. We didn't have any for Manatee County, so it was really critical for us to extend that community monitoring program up through Manatee County. And it feels really good to be able to tell the people who volunteer with us that they are literally collecting data we don't have in any other way that um, helps us communicate better about the health of our estuary. I'll just put out there that I think that the the commercial recreational fishing community is an undertapped resource. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they stepped up in a big way to help us understand and give us the first signs of some of those, um, those staphis blooms that we were seeing. Yeah. And I joke now around the room because I think like my phone is full of text messages, which is like modern day scientific correspondence of like people reporting algae blooms now. You know, people in this room, people that are out there fishing. And so I think those would be great partners. And then I also think back to the first day and um, Dr. Skripnikov's presentation about how to use things like Twitter and social media. Because mm -hmm. the other thing I found is there's a few groups like fishermen groups and things like that where I kind of get a, a heads up on where things are happening. I just spoke with some of the folks from EPC about some, some phytoplankton blooms in Alifaya that the fishermen are seeing before we are. So I think that there's maybe the opportunity to, to pair these great stories from the people that are on the water and to scrape the social media, the digital places that we're all living, and then combine that and field verify it. So I think that's sort of like the wave of where we need to be thinking. I have another question if we have time. This one's for Luis. I think we're all seeing rapid change in our estuaries and we're seeing seagrass loss and we're concerned about it. And we know how long it takes to get the kind of accurate information that comes to us from the water management district, from aerial mapping programs. We know how long it takes to get bodies on the ground just once a year to map a transect. So can you talk to us a little bit about the opportunities you, th you see for remotely sensed data and how we might use that information to complement what we're already doing? Sure, so we found that uh, using satellite imagery is not like a perfect method. It has some uh, also some issues, but so that's why we wanted to focus only on the seagrass and the uh, dense seagrass beds. So. This is where we have an opportunity for tracking all of those uh, dense seagrass beds, uh, especially if, uh, using Sentinel-2 data, because Sentinel-2 data provides a lot of images over a year. Uh, 
we were able to map the seagrasses in Tampa Bay, which are super complex waters. Uh, I don't think that there was a study uh, using satellite imagery for detecting seagrass beds in Tampa Bay before. Uh, so with this, uh, there is a, uh, opportunities for mapping seagrasses in or in other areas, in other regions, with uh, where the where the uh, the water is not so complex as as in these uh, estuaries. So I know that the 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 ground truth data is very important. We also use a lot of uh, some visual interpretation of the images, of course, because we have like this background of the uh, seagrass distribution in Tampa Bay. So sometimes it was like very easy to see just by eye that there was uh, seagrass there. I have answers for you, Maya. I love it. <laughs> I always need answers. So I think in um, the Tampa Bay area, I know it's been plugged a few times and our TBEP is very instrumental in the proceedings, but we have the Southwest Florida Ramp Group. So one of the goals of that, you know, is, <laughs> you know, we try to bring these kind of topics to the area where we can regionally look at, okay, how can we build in macroalgae? Because I know for us, if we have the knowledge and can get our staff trained, we can start speciating. I mean, even from being out with Sheila, <laughs> I've started being like acanthophora, <laughs> you know? So, so I think sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, do we ask more of them? But I think trying to establish or use some of these forums that exist that, you know, I'm preaching to the choir is, is a great way to start because scientists love being scientists so if we can <laughs> get more knowledge and share that but part of it is you know i think a big push for the open science like we can collect it but where are we going to put it so how can the estuary programs facilitate that data stream where we can just easily add data and then hopefully marcus in our region or ed and <laughs> y'all need to get you a marcus <laughs> Hey, this is for Darcy and Jill. There are you know, several citizen science programs starting now with seagrass monitoring. There's one up in Chesapeake Bay as well. Um, is there any sort of uniformity amongst the programs? Is Are the systems too different that it's not really worth that? Or are you guys starting to see if there's something like this iSeagrass app that everyone can use and is more of an open science thing for various programs? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Darcy. You can go ahead, Jill. It's all right. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, there there are a handful of tools out there. There's Seagrass Spotter. There's um, Seagrass Watch. There's Seagrass Net. Um, they all have varying degrees of uh, how technically challenging they are, and what types of seagrasses they'd work best with. Um, you know, what Seagrass Spotter is just kind of looking over the boat and clicking a point where you see it. So there's nothing really quantifiable about that. It would help you put some points on a map. Um, our method was, was really tailored to answer a, a pretty specific question in that embayment where we saw lots of loss. And we're just sort of finding opportunistically that it's working for uh, to answer other questions too. Um, so I, I think there's probably a lot of places where the programs could have some overlap and could even learn from each other or borrow techniques from each other. But in some ways, they, they also have to answer pretty specific questions too. Yeah, I, I would agree with Jill. I think that um, you know different areas do have have different questions, um, and so you end up with different products because um, you know for one reason or, or another, maybe we haven't figured out how to specify questions within the same app. But um, that is one strength I think we're trying to build in what we call the Eyes on Seagrass program, although it really should be called Eyes on Macroalgae. It's just we couldn't get any volunteers if it was called that. Um, <laughs> it's that we are really trying to use the same methods um, in every estuary that's that's adopting those so that we can compare across systems um, 
and and make that stronger. So we don't have an app for that. We are still doing that. Um, that is paper, but um, you know, we would probably love to partner with someone who'd love who'd like to make that a more universal app that people could use, and that would expand the reach of it. Okay, we got uh, one more. Hey, hey, Lewis. Um, apologies, I actually missed some of the the presentation. So apologies if this was answered. But for the um, for the satellite imagery. Is there any potential to use vegetation indices to pick up sublethal stress on the seagrasses? Can you repeat the question? Sure. So when you're using um, yeah, remotely sensed uh, data for, for the seagrass monitoring, um, is there potential to use things like NDVI, like we might use for terrestrial vegetation, to pick up stress in the in the seagrass? Yeah, uh, there are uh, people that do that, but this is uh, sometimes complicated because we need to uh, more uh, in situ data of the water column. So, for example, we need uh, chlorophyll concentration and also the water color measurements just to correct for that uh, when we use the satellite data. So this is more complex and, of course, it's going to cost uh, more. So. But uh, yeah, if someone can, uh, want to do that, yeah, they can do it. Okay, well, thank you everyone for a great discussion session following our presenters and thanks to all of our presenters uh, for some great talks this morning. And with that, we will wrap up our marine macrophyte session. Thank you.